you. So I'm going to do a prelude to Michal's talk later. So I'm going to survey the sub-exponential algorithm for completion problems. I'm going to slowly define what I mean by that and I'm, what I'm going to say there. So let me first apologize to these ones who already heard me with this topic. So I'm not, in some sense, this topic will be a bit about a slightly stale bread. I mean, the latest result I'm going to talk about is something like appeared on Archive in early 2014. So this is not that super fresh, as for example, today morning talk, when there was like bored talk of something that was just sent to stock. And I hope so, I think so. And <laughs> then, uh, uh, but that's first as a prelude to Michals, and then this in some sense, as I would call it like a success story or something like we really managed to f get all the, or almost all the positive result upper bounds like that we think that are tight. Now we are waiting for the lower bounds and that's what Michal will be talking about. But in some sense we think that we get most of what we can get or get almost of what we can get in terms of upper bounds in the like fine-grained parent-try setting. That's in some sense this sort of success story. Of course there's like, okay, there are some disclaimers but let's go on. Okay, so first let's define what we are interested in. And now let me now start with such sort of an elevator pitch about graph modification problems when they are interesting and why particularly parenterized complexity, FPT algorithms are a very good framework to work with them. So let's think of like some graph representing a result of your experiment. So the usual, the usual ex example here is that, okay, every node is some some observation or some object and the edge corresponds to whether we think this is similar object or the same object or not. And, of, and you think, okay, if this is like measurement of objects and an edge, whether we think this is like the same object or similar object, then they somehow should look like cluster graph. I mean, they should form cliques, like similar objects should form cliques and not similar objects should be like completely separate. There should be no edges between them. So the graph of such an experiment or such observations should look like a cluster graph, a disjoint union of cliques. But of course, in the that's our theory that's behind this shadow one, that's our theory. But of course we have got some error in measurements. So that means that, I mean, some edges are present which shouldn't be present there. I mean, some there are some false, false positives or false negatives. Some of these edges here are missing. I mean, the red edges were, are the missing edges, okay? And of course, if we are good scientists, we believe that we've developed a very good and experiment, we believe that there are only few errors in our whole measurement, and now we want to fix these errors. I mean, we want to detect, I mean, we want to say that, okay, our, ex uh, our experiment data matches our uh, theory, and which is our theory, so we want to detect these few errors and fix them and say, okay, this is a cluster graph, and we can say that the number of modifications uh, is a parameter. I mean, that's the, I mean, that's what we say in the FPT standard. I mean, if, if you think of FPT that this is like the principle that you have got this big instance with this small parameter and you want to solve the instances with small parameter and big instances but with small parameter, then having like a big experiment with only a few errors, that suits very well the, like the fixed parameter like idea how where this should be applicable or where, where which, which type of instances should we be able to solve and efficiently. Okay, so that's the graph modification promise. And we are particularly interested in this talk about only like one-sided error. That means that there can be missing edges, but there, there are no extra edges, so we can only add edges. So in some sense, you can think of like, we want to add a few edges to the graph to make it consistent with your theory or to fall into some graph class that represents your theoretical expectations. And okay, in our running example of like cluster graph, I believe everybody can develop a very quick polynomial time algorithm for completing the cluster graph. That's not very, uh, sophisticated, but let's keep with this example. So we can think of this, but I want now to convey the idea that you can think of this graph modification problems towards some graph class in two different ways. So we can think of, for example, cluster graphs you want to complete so that every connected component is a click. And that's like, in some sense, the positive way, the thinking of like, what's the structure of the graph? But you can also think about the bad guys. When, what breaks you, what stops you from being a cluster graph? Well, a cluster graph is a graph that doesn't contain any P3, any like free vertex path as an induced subgraph. So you can think like, I want to kill or induce subgraphs that belong to some set of forbidden subgraphs, or the minimal forbidden subgraphs from my graph class. So you can think in terms of either I want to build clicks or I want to kill all P3s. There so are like two different ways of thinking. And actually, if you start working with this, they lead to very different types of things or like types of algorithms, so what you try to do. Okay, so let's uh, let's go there and there's a side note that 
are for like for vertex deletion problems that you want to delete vertices to get some graph class. There's a known dichotomy saying that uh, essentially everything you want to solve is empty hard, whether for completion problems it's highly unclear what's actually P polynomial time solvable or almost NP hard. Okay. So the credit, so here we worked with the cluster graphs and as probably most of you already noticed, uh, adding edges to get a cluster graph is not the most exciting problem, but there are a few graph classes maybe slightly similar to the cluster graphs that actually turns out to be quite interesting and challenging. And these are these graph classes. Some of them may be familiar to you, some of them not. I'm not going to define most of these classes. You can always check them later. Apart from that, the interesting ones for us will be the chordal graphs, inter interval graphs, particularly in this talk. So the, the interval graphs, I think already Daniel defined very quickly in the morning, that are the intersection graph of intervals on a line. So every vertex corresponds to an interval and two inter to vertices are adjacent if the intervals overlap. And chordal, you can think of the same inside the, inside the tree. So if I've got some big tree and the vertices correspond to subtrees, or you can think in the other way around as the graph such that there are no induced cycles apart from triangles inside the graph. So every cycle has got some cores inside there. It's triangulated. <coughs> okay. And why these classes are interesting, especially from the point of view of completing them, because some, in some sense completing a graph to a chordal graph or completing a graph to an interval graph corresponds to having a tree decomposition or a path decomposition of a graph. So for example, you can think of like, have your favorite graph, you have your tree decomposition, and now if you turn every bug into a click, uh, that this, this became a chordal graph. So you can think like of having a path decomposition or a tree decomposition as a completion to chordal graph or a completion to interval graph, and the weaves of this decomposition correspond to the maximum size of a click in a, in a graph, in a chordal graph or interval graph you come up there. And there are like other measures like the vertex cover size, tree depth, and bandwidth correspond in the same sense to proper interval, trivial, perfect, and threshold graphs. You can make this establishment. And like this is like this tilde usually means that there's like plus minus one error. I mean, because somebody subtracts one from three if from the size of the bag, that means that there's some minus one up there or something. Okay. So that's the classes we are going to study here. But let's start from, so now I'm going to in some sense survey or like give you idea how to approach such problems, completion problems. So let's start with a class similar to this graph classes, but slightly different, slightly different. Okay, sorry, I forgot about the disclaimer. So I'm going to look at f of k. Uh, in the run FPT running time, so this is the FPT running time, where I'm going to look at the function f of k, what's the optimal one, mainly because that's the thing that we can have, we had in a few recent years very tight bounds for a number of problems, what's the optimal num function f of k, and we don't have any, now, I mean, we can try to get good linear, good uh, polynomial factors, but we, I mean, except for the few polynomial recent uh, results, we don't have any good bounds. So, I mean, this, this talk is about the study of FK. Studying polynomial factors is also a nice study, but I'm going to focus on FK in this talk. Okay. So I'm going to look first at the split graphs. Split graphs are graphs similar or even like simpler or more, res more restrictive case than the, pr than the ones we talked previously. There are the graphs such that you can decompose the vertex set into a click. This is a click and an independent set. And there are some arbitrary connections between these two parts. And if you look at the forbidden subgraph definition, I mean, which guys are f forbidden, it turns out that this exactly corresponds to graphs that, that do not contain any cycle on four vertices, five vertices, or like 2K2. 2K2 is just two parallel edges as an induced subgraph. So this, are, this is a split competition. And now, okay, so I want to add edges to have a split graph, which means that I want to add edges to kill all such subgraphs, such induced subgraphs, which means that I can, okay, is my graph split graph? Well, not. Here is C4, for example. Okay, H given C4, you can add this edge or this edge to kill, to kill it, so you branch into two directions. For C5, that's five directions. For 2K2, that's four directions. And generally, it was like formalized in the 90s that, I mean, in all these graph classes that you have got a finite number of forbidden subgraphs, what you do, you look if your graph belongs to your graph class. If not, you find one of the minimal forbidden new subgraph, and you branch into bounded number of ways how to kill him. And that's like C to the K FPT algorithms. Now we even know that that means that there is like two, better than two to the power n exponential time algorithm. Okay, so that's the simple branching strategy, and it works for a number of graph classes from the previous slide. I listed here four of them, or I mean similar. I mean graph classes like similar type because they all have finite set of forbidden into subgraphs. Okay. So going, so okay, so this was for FPT, this finite set somewhat boring. So let's go to the infinite set F because it's 
sometimes, sometimes happens. And the first good example is chordal graphs. The chordal graphs are exactly the graphs that don't have as induced subgraphs any of the cycles except for the triangle. So C4, C5, and all this stuff. So you get a cycle. And now how, you know, how many ways you can break it by adding an edge? Well, there are many ways. But the point is here that you need to add a lot of edges to break it completely. Because say you add one edge. But now after adding, for example, this edge, you start to have got two shorter holes, two shorter induced cycles to kill, and you need to add them more add more edges to fill in, uh, to triangulate this entire cycle. And there are a few, there are a few ways, but if you look at it, there are the number of, if you want to add, if you have a hole of length L, the number of ways how to triangulate is something like the L minus one Catalan number, and you add L, L minus three edges. So if you make up the numbers, you see that if you take a hole and just branch in which out of C, L, L minus second, Catalan number which way you triangulate it, but then you see how, you, how many edges you use. It's something like 4 to the k branching in the end because the Catalan numbers are something like uh, 2n to n, roughly. Okay, so that's the branching. And okay, so you can do coral completion in this time because that's again the branching. And also, this also works for proper interval completion because if you look at forbidden use subgraphs for proper interval graphs, these are essentially all the holes and a few small guys. So you either have a small guy or you have a hole, and this branching gives you some CD decay branching for proper interval completion. Okay. So from the original slide of FBT, we got almost all solved except for the interval guys. Because the interval, if you look at the interval graphs, the interval graphs has got quite nasty characterization by forbidden induced subgraphs. Well, interval graphs are, uh, are in particular chordal graphs, so they have got all the holes are forbidden induced subgraphs. But also there are something called ATs. So without going to definitions, the minimal ATs are looking like this ones. So this is like a graph, and this path at the bottom is arbitrarily long. And now look, if you want to break such a guy by adding an edge, well, you can add the edge from the top guy to any guy in the bottom, and you, this becomes an interval graph. So there's, this is a huge guy, and you can break it by one edge in many different ways. I mean, adding edge from the top guy to any guy in the bottom. And in some sense, that's a problem, yeah? because that means that, I mean, there's like unbounded number of ways how to fix it, and using only one edge there. So this typical branching strategy doesn't work, and people were, uh, people were uh, stuck with this problem. It was like in the graph modification community, there was a problem for long while, and uh, finally it was fixed. Uh, it was f new solved a few years back, still by some branching strategy, but something much more clever than was before. And recently we have a paper of fixing here, somewhere, yep, yep. And which shows that you can get a C to the K branching even with the linear time, which sounds very cool. And that's, I would say, I mean, you have got very good dependency here and keeping a linear time, that sounds awesome. Okay, so that seems like a closed case, yes? I mean, we have got the FPT algorithms, mostly C to the K. It's quite, it's all branching, so probably even if we want to implement, it's not so bad. But okay, so the next question we ask in the parameterized complexity is, the next question we want to ask in parameterized complexity is about kernels, polynomial kernels. Can you compress the instance to size polynomial in K? And people ask these questions. So this first paper already cited for cordial completion or also gives some arguments why there's polynomial kernel. I'm not sure if they really called it polynomial kernel, but I mean, essentially you can extract from the arguments polynomial kernel up there. There was a paper of Guo who treated a few small over, over classes and solved polynomial kernels there. For completion, I mean, if you consider vertex addition problems to some graph classes which has got finite set of forbidden subgraphs, you get automatically polynomial kernel because this is essentially some heating set instance, some bounded set heating set instance. For edge deletion or completion problem, this is not the case because adding an edge, you can create a new forbidden subgraph and this can cascade. And actually this can happen. There is a lower bound from I a few years back that shows some small, a few vertex, I mean like eight vertex or seven vertex, I don't remember exactly, uh, graph. So there's completion to guy killing, this, to kill all these guys actually does not need polynomial kernel. So this in some sense can cascade this effect in this part. But yeah, but still the interesting graph classes, natural graph classes, turn out mostly to have polynomial kernel. These papers are sometimes somehow involved. This is a really long paper and involved, but they have, but they turn out to have mostly polynomial kernel. The missing thing here is the interval completion problem, and it's still open here, and that will cause us some problems later in the slides. Okay, but yeah, so we have got mostly polynomial kernel. So apart from kernel for interval completion, it seems that we're mostly done, and yeah, we're happy. We can go for a beer. Okay, but it turned out that no, 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 this is not the end. So 
Okay, so all, everything I was talking for the last few slides was about, essentially I was looking at the characterization by forbidden subgraphs. I was thinking, I have a hole, I need to kill a hole. I have got an AT, I need to kill an AT. I've got some K, 2K2, I need to kill, K, kill 2K2. But it turns out that the other way of thinking that I want to create a chordal graph, a graph whose tree decomposition con has a click in every, every back is a click, or similar way of thinking, actually is more fruitful and or more fruitful and gives sufficient result. And there was a paper at SODA 2012 by Fomin and Villinger that shows that actually you can get a sub exponential algorithm for chordal completion. And after looking for a number of ETH lower bounds and then that may should surprise you. I mean, especially apart from the planar stuff, which Daniel will be talking on Friday, we have very little planar, like exclude minor sparse graph classes. We get very little sub exponential algorithm uh, in FPT world. So that was somewhat surprise at this point. And yeah. so now my goal is to oh, sorry. Now my goal is to argue how you get this type of running time using like the approach, like trying to completely forbid about. Uh, chordal graphs being graphs that do not have holes. I want to think of chordal graphs as graphs that has got like tree-like structure where every back is a click. Okay. So, so let's go. Uh, so let's go this way. So what I want to do, I want to build this graph, uh, this solution graph, so G, the this click solution of G plus the added edges by dynamic programming. And the high-level idea is that. I, I mean, the key observation or the, the, the key technical result of this thing is that there is only like only sub exponential number of reasonable like parts in this in this dynamic programming when I want to somehow build this click tree, this click tree of the completed graph by uh, dynamic programming. And so the strategy is to, okay, we start with a polynomial kernel that will help us later. And we are going to enumerate some sub-exponential number of candidates for some sort of like maximal clicks in the graph, for example. I mean, this, all these crucial structures will be playing around maximal clicks. And the bound we'll obtain will be of sort of like n to the square root of k. So what we'll try to do, for example, the quarter graphs is that there are only n to the square root of k reasonable choices for a maximal click in the completed graph. So you're going to turn your graph in a quarter graph. There are some maximal clicks in this quarter graph. And I want to say that there's only like n to the square root of k reasonable things that can ma be made a maximal click in the final graph. And if I apply polynomial kernel at the beginning, that means that n is polynomial in k, then this is like something like 2 to the square root of k log k. So this is like sub-exponential. Okay, and from this candidate structure, from the bound of number maximal clicks, uh, I will get a dynamic programming algorithm. Okay, so now I want to spend the remaining 10 minutes, or uh, maybe I got 11 minutes, so I want to spend 10 minutes on sketching what does it mean to turn a candidate structure into DP state. I want to sketch some sort of like, how do you prove such type of row bounds on some simple example, and spend the remaining minute on like big table of results we get so far. Okay. So let's, uh, okay, so, but before that, I want to make a, a sort of like, mm, I don't know, a flash of what we already get. So for this graph class that I had got at the very beginning, we got this running times so far. So there's like k to the square root of k. We somewhat believe, I will argue on the last slide, why we believe this running time is optimal, or like to the square root of k, I mean up to polylogs in the exponent. For proper interval, we got two thirds and we don't know how to improve. We believe it should be square root of k, but we have got no idea how to improve it. Okay, so let's look at back at the color completion and let's try to make the dp. And as I said, the crucial structure around the dp is the maximal clique here, or like minimal separator, like intersection of two neighboring maximal clique and a quarter graph. And what we get, I mean, we assume that there's like only, uh, I mean, what they actually do in the paper, they say that either there's some very efficient branching step or there's only like sub exponential number of candidate maximal clicks for the solution graph. Uh, and also for click separators, because you can always take two maximal clicks, intersect them, and say this is a candidate click separator. Okay, so what I want to do, I want to look at, I want to take this pink candidate, so I see this pink candidate, I don't see this entire graph, I just see this pink candidate. I, Temporarily deleted from the graph, and the graph splits into connected components. Okay, this will be probably one connected component, and this will be probably second connected component. The point is that the interval, the quarter completion solution, the minimal solution, does not have got any incentive to later once he clickifies when this is turned into a click, 
there's no incentive to glue them up together. There's no hole passing either. All the holes are either on the left or all the holes are on the right. So it won't add any edge from here to here. It's easy to check. So essentially you can independently solve the pink part and solve the gray part now. Uh, and this can be phrased as a dynamic programming state that giving this quick separator and pointing to one of the components like orange one. I want to find the minimum size of a completion that in particular turns the pink guy into a click. And then you can like build this three from the bottom to top using these DP states. Okay, so that's like, the point is that the, once you clickify this guy, I mean the main message here is that once you turn this pink guy into a click, the connected components up there are like, you solve them independently and you can do think of this in terms of branching or divine conquer, but the better way of doing it is actually doing by DP, uh, by direct programming up there. Okay, so that's the point. And, and there's also like, I mean, in the same fashion, I mean, having this one, you can do chain completion, but that's, that's, that's not that strong important here. So we have got this type of result that was crucial for Cordial graphs. It actually was quite quick to get from this type of result to the DP, it was quite natural. And, but in the paper to get there, it was quite involved and I don't have time and resources here to present it. I want to give you a flavor of what the type of arguments say and I want to prove the following statement. If you are trying to solve interval completion, that means that you want to add edges to get an interval graph, I want to prove that there are only n to the square root of k reasonable candidates for maximal clicks in this fashion. Okay? That's the thing that in the next five minutes I'm trying to like give you the flavor of the proof, how do you, how do you prove it? Okay. Okay. So let's look at the interval graph. This is interval graph. Yeah, there are intervals. Every interval is a vertex. If, we into, if two intervals overlap, there's an edge between the vertices in the graph. Okay? And the maximal click is something like you, uh, okay. It, you start, you start uh, uh, you, uh, when some, some interval starts and then some vertex ends. This is a maximal click in the interval graph. Okay. So let's define the main, like, every, almost every uh, algorithm, or almost every algorithm in this area starts with saying, okay, a cheap vertex is a vertex that has got only square root of k, at most square root of k incident edges from the solution, and the expensive one is the one that has got more. The point is that you, the solution has got only 2k endpoints, which means that, that there are only like two square root of k expensive guys in the solution. Okay? And I want to identify, looking at this click, I want to define like the last chip vertex before the click and the first chip vertex after the click, like last, uh, last end point of a chip vertex and first starting point of the chip vertex up here. Okay, so there's the green, green guys. And now if you look at this area between here, between the maximal click and this chip guy, well, only the expensive guys can end here. So there are like only two square root of k ending, ending guys here. Let's call them dollar one. And the guys that start here needs to be expensive. Let's call them dollar two. Okay, and the observation is here that if you look at the guy here, let's look at this guy X here, and he's in this maximal click. And I ask myself a question, why I draw this interval in my optimum solution up here to the end, why I draw him up here to the end, why I didn't stop him here? I want to shorten this interval and stop him, stop him here. Why I cannot do it? Well, because there's some edge that blocks me. This edge can be either to V1, it can be either to one, one of these expensive guys here, or it can be to somebody later there. I mean, it can be stretched very far away, maybe it's longer, and so somebody here. But if it's longer, if it's up here, that means that he needs to know C1. Uh, so let's look at this formula. He either knows V1, he knows one of the expensive guys up here, or he knows C1, but either in the graph or after adding the solution. Here, F denotes the solution. So the vertex X, we I mean, I cannot shorten the guy because he knows somebody here on the left and that can be indicated by either knowing somebody here in this area here, but there are only like, I mean, there are only the expensive guys in V1 here or knowing C1, but that means that I needed to add an edge of, or to C1 or there was already one. So using this type of argumentation, you can prove that actually this maximal click, I mean, otherwise you can shorten it and save something, for example, on an edge from X to one in the solution. So you can actually show that, I mean, this is the only reason for why the X is in the solution. So like this maximal clicks is really like the neighborhood of V1 plus the neighborhood of expensive guys here plus the neighborhood of C1 plus the solution neighborhood of C1. Intersection, the same symmetrical reasoning on the second side. Is tight. Okay. And that, uh, so we have got this lemma, and now the observation is that how many choices do I have for all these object listed here? Well, there are like 
n to the four ob choices for like this four vertices here, appearing in this. The expensive guys are only square root of k of them, so this set has like n to the square root of k choices. And these guys were cheap, so the number of incident solution edges are only also square root of k of them. So you got like also only n to the square root of k choices for these incident edges. And you get your bound n to the square root of k for the number of candidates maximal clicks there. Okay. Okay, I got three minutes left, so I want, so I would say very briefly that there are like more problems because we don't have polynomial kernels, so like n to the square root of k is not a PT even for us, so we need to circumvent, and we do a lot of technical cranking, technical cranking, some ideas there to get there, but yeah. So we eventually end with the uh, result saying that, okay, if you guess completed edges to one vertex, there are only few, there are less than like n to the, I mean, less than brute force bound on the number of reasonable ways to choose completion edges. And we also show that I actually can enhance the previous reasoning to get some FPT type bound for the number of reasonable maximal clicks. Okay? And the second thing is that the DP doesn't work well because if one color graphs, you, we said that you can independently solve every connected component after you delete a click. In uh, interval case, you got only left and right. You cannot like glue many components together. You got only left and right. And that means that there's different DP and sometimes our DP needs to go in this direction. I mean, in some sense, try such a pyramid and like go top to bottom rather than left to right on such an interval graph. That means that there's a very complicated DP somewhere there hidden and it's not time to make details. This is just the time to show a number of other results in this direction as I'm going to do surveys. So there is, uh, mm, so there was a paper from, I mean, it's a bunch of people from Chennai, I think, uh, on SWOT that showed that for split completion, you don't need any machinery, you need just chromatic coding. And there was a paper at Stax a few years back uh, that shows, essentially solved the trivially perfect completion paper and a few other ones, but the, this was the main result up there, that the trivially perfect completion is square root of k, is sub-exponential, and we have got Okay, so this is the summary of all the results we have so far. So for many of these graph classes, I showed up there, we got k to the square root of k algorithm. Uh, sometimes with very nasty polynomial factors, depending on the n, but sometimes not, and depending whether you have a good kernel or not. Apart from proper interval, that's k to the, k to the first, we don't know how to improve it. And a few similar graph classes, but maybe with slightly less structure in terms of like tree decomposition or path decomposition, turn out to be hard under NTH to get sub-exponential kernel, and this includes, for example, cographs, which was quite surprising. Okay? So that's just the summary I want to say, and I want to finish with some open problems. So first, I mean, there's one thing which we don't know how to make square root. There's some trivial trade-off which led to k to the two first, and we don't know how to improve it. Maybe you know how to improve it. And the second thing is you can trash half of our paper on interval completion if you know how to do coordinate kernel for this problem. So that's a good incentive. I can delete like 40 pages or 30 pages of a paper if I know how to do polynomial kernel. I would be happy to see polynomial kernel up there. And the question is like, okay, we believe that um, the square root of k is the optimal one. I don't know whether we're polylog or not. There's a question about polylog or not, but I don't know whether this log needs to appear there or not. But the thing is, that the reason why we somehow don't believe or are, are always skeptical about having like sub, sub below square root of k in the exponent is that this means that there's like sublinear in terms of the number of vertices. Now that seems really hard to be sublinear in the number of vertices in the exponent. So can you get some hour bounds? And that seems really hard and that's what Michal will be talking about. And maybe you can have some more formal explanation apart from, yeah, this graph classes corresponds to this important parameter, so this graph has got some structural, structure, structural properties that we can explore, why actually this type of problems have got sub-exponential growing and other dot. Okay, thank you.